So good morning everyone and my name is Umberto and I'm going to talk to you about how I integrated OpenMS with a configuration management software which is called SaltStack. How many of you know what configuration management software is? How many of you use it? Well, so it's free, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, a configuration management software is basically a system where you describe what your servers are and what you want them to do. And so like you have profile for a web server, a database server, and you say, okay, on the web server I want a patch installed and then I want PHP 5 installed and then I want the configuration file for Apache to look like this. And then the, for on the DB server you say I want PostgreSQL installed and I want a database created and a username and the configuration for Postgres is like that. And then with the configuration management software you basically say, okay, deploy those changes on host X and host Y and the configuration, configuration management software actually pull, pushes those changes to the machines and actually configures the machine as you wish. So it's kind of cool because it also abstracts all the differences between like CentOS and Ubuntu and Arch Linux. So it doesn't really care about what kind of operating system you use as long as it's supported and will abstract the changes between the operating systems. So this integration is about using SaltStack and OpenMS together. Before we start, link to the slides and the code is this one. So it's a repository on GitHub. So you can see the slides and the code. The code is actually very small for the integration because it's around 20 lines of code, so it's not a lot of stuff. Um, my Twitter handle, afactotum, if you want to follow, send questions or uh, need information. No cat pictures, I promise. And so let's get started. Um, the scenario for this integration is actually, I think, a scenario that many, may, probably some of you are familiar with. And basically, um, it started when we, two, a couple of, two years ago, we got a new customer and he has a, a private cloud running VMware vSphere. And the first thing that, and we do system administration consulting services for them. And the first thing, first thing that we did was installing OpenNMS. So we started, you know, uh, keeping an eye on the monitor, on the systems, on the network, and it was all running pretty well. Until last year, I decided also to in, introduce a configuration management software and I picked SaltStack for various reasons. Maybe we can discuss them later. And the idea was, uh, since SaltStack doesn't have uh, um, an adapter for vSphere, I actually wrote uh, some small VM provisioning script so that I can provision VMs from within SaltStack automatically. So basically, the provisioning script is just something that runs when you deploy a new template in vSphere and the provisioning script hooks up to SaltStack and uh, asks the server what is the IP address of the machine, which is the virtual network of the machine, and then it moves the machine into the appropriate virtual network, gives the right IP address, then reboots the machine once again, and after that, SaltStack takes over and pushes the configuration into the machine. So basically, simply by right-clicking on a, on a template and, and uh, say, deploy a new virtual machine from a template, I can actually get a new virtual machine deployed in like five or 10 minutes, which is pretty cool. The only thing that was actually bothering me is that I still had to go into OpenMS and type all the same information I already written into SaltStack into OpenMS. So I had to say, you know, I want this, this machine to have this IP address and um, I want you to monitor it in this provisioning um, group. So I decided to write the integration and this is the aspect you are going to talk about. So the integration is between SaltStack and OpenMS because I already have the information into SaltStack and I, want, I don't want you know, to retype the same information into OpenMS. Because in this case, I'm, I'm, it's the same guy in doing the, the operation, but in a, in a situation where maybe you have two teams, one provisioning the, the machines and another one actually keeping the monitoring up to date, you want the two teams you know, to, to be always in sync, so you are, you are actually monitoring everything that is actually being deployed into the infrastructure. So before we actually get into the, the integration, I just want to give you a quick overview of SaltStack. So SaltStack um, is uh, like a kind of, uh, it works like kind of Puppet or Chef. So th those two are the big names in the configuration management space. And only, uh, it is also a remote execution tool. So remote execution means that you actually run comments on all your hosts from within SaltStack. 
With Popular Chef, you can't do that. You have to use other tools like Fabric or uh, SSH for loop, which is the most popular, I guess. And it's written in Python, which I kind of like because my Python skills are actually better than my Ruby skills. And it's also pretty cool because it uses YAML for configuration files. And so it's less complicated than learning a Ruby DSL. And I think it's awesome, actually. It's pretty young. So it's not really you know, like a popular project yet, but I think it's going to gain traction and be more popular. It's based over a zero MQ uh, communication layer. So it's very fast. Communication is actually very fast. It uses a push model, which is very different from Puppet and Chef, because in SaltStack, the master is actually pushing the commands to the minions as soon as he gets new stuff to do. And the minions actually is, is the salt speak term for the slaves or the, the host that he actually commands to. Uh, uses a PKI for communication, authentication, and encryption. So all the communication between the master and the minions is actually encrypted. And this is actually a strategic point because the PKI, I will, I will use the PKI infrastructure for actually for in the integration. And also, it's growing very fast. It's actually, uh, it was ranked number eight on GitHub by number of contributors. So, I mean, GitHub is kind of like four million projects, I guess. So it's pretty good. Uh, I mean, investing in, into, into SaltStack is probably a good thing because you see the community is so large that you will not be let down, probably. Um, so, um, the fact that Salt is growing so fast, because actually they release a new version every, every month, more or less. So, actually you have to, keep, you know, it's kind of hard to keep the pace of the releases and they are always pushing out new features. So, uh, the, the, this thing, you know, um, actually made me write two versions of the integration. A, a first one that was in production until uh, last February, and the second one, which is actually the coolest one, and which is, has been in production for one month only, but it's actually the most feature complete, and it's the one that I like best. Um, so the first one is actually based around the DNS importer uh, feature that is, that is present into OpenMS. So um, uh, the idea is that Salt generates a DNS zone file from its own configuration data, and then DNS, and then OpenMS imports the DNS zone file. So it's actually pretty simple. The other one is more complicated, but we'll get to that. Um, so the first, the first option. Option one, um, the idea is, oh, I'm going pretty fast. <laughs> the idea is to have uh, Salt generate one or more zone files and OpenMS imported the zone file. So it's actually a pretty uh, simple configuration. There is no coding required, so you don't, uh, so I didn't have to write any code into, into, into f for this integration to work. And I just had to configure OpenMS to import the zones. So uh, pretty much like, um, it's, it's, it's quite standard configuration, so you just have to configure the requisition. Actually, an example DNS uh, provisioning configuration is already included in, in the standard provision.xml file, so you just have to uncomment and set the right parameters, which are actually the, um, the, re the requisition name and the path, actually the URL to DNS server. In this case, I'm running the DNS server on the salt master server. And, uh, and the, the, the zone is called Linux servers, so because I decided to group my Linux servers on one, on one provisioning group. And we import this requisition every day at midnight. So you see that one, one thing with this integration is that it's not immediate. If you push a new machine into production, it, it will get into OpenMS only the day after. So there is like a time delay between the machine is actually in, in, uh, alive in your system, your infrastructure, and you're actually getting data into OpenMS about that machine. This is the code for DNS zone generation into SALT. It's actually a bit complicated. Um, it's a Jinja code because SALT stack uses Jinja as the template in engine. So you can think of this uh, like PHP. Basically, you see this is a standard DNS zone file and it's peppered with this Python uh, commands which actually uh, do, do the, the, all the hard stuff of pulling the information out of the uh, SALT stack server and then Pull, pushing the information into the file. So basically, what we do here, uh, we loop over all the, mm, the minions, all the hosts, and then for each host, we query about two pieces of information. If we have um, 
a requisition, uh, if we have an attribute on the minion which is called zone, and if the, if the zone matches the, the, the name of the file that we're actually um, processing, so the name of the file is Linux servers, and Linux servers, if you recall, actually matches the provisioning that we configured into OpenMS in the previous step. And if it matches, we actually put, we put the line into the DNS file, so we have here uh, a record for for the minion name, and we put we and we get the first Ethernet address of the Linux host into the file. So that's it. It's pretty straightforward. This code could actually be better. I actually uh, let it know like uh, I use a very naive um, coding style for this because I want you know to to actually grasp the the, the, the for loops. There are actually ways to make this code better, and I think somebody forked the gist on GitHub and actually made um, a cleaner, more Pythonic version. And the result is that I had this integration in production for six months, so mostly, so something like around last September uh, until this February. So the cool things about this integration is that there is absolutely no coding required. You reuse components that are already available in the system which means in the case you upgrade the system, uh, you, you don't have to rewrite your code or adapt your code. You're using code that's already there. So uh, who wrote the DNS provision adapter or um, the, uh, the salt stack team will actually take care of all the code changes for you. It is provisioning aware, which means that actually the, uh, the, the Linux service will be um, provisioned into a provisioning group, so you actually should apply, you know, CAPSD policies and stuff like that. And so it, it's also uh, pretty nice. One thing that I didn't like about this integration is that you couldn't attach metadata. So say you wanted to, say in that in salt stack you had uh, asset information, you can't push that information into OpenMS. You have to type them manually into the uh, provisioning. And of course, there's, there's no support for decommissioning, which means that when you remove a node, the node from salt stack, the node will not be removed from the provisioning group. You will have to remove it manually. And the other thing that bothered me was that there's this time delay between the time that you actually deploy the node and the time that it gets into OpenMS and, it's, and it starts to be monitored. So I come up with a second version, and the second version was actually, and this is the one that I like. And the second version is actually um, the one that um, was actually made possible because uh, in 10.5, in SALT 10.5, which was released around December last year, they introduced um, a pa an event API, an event bus, which is a very cool feature. Basically, the SALT server has an event bus that you can actually tap into and say, I want to be notified whenever a minion comes up, or I want to notify whenever there's a new job or a new configuration push, and, and you can actually react to those events. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I believe you can also push your own events into it. So you can say, um, this minion is like, you know, uh, this, well, this application service is actually overused, so the CPU utilization is uh, over the roof, and I want to, to add a new system, so you can actually send events to SaltStack, and SaltStack can actually deploy new machines and configure them, add them to the load balancer configuration. So it's pretty cool, awesome thing. Uh, this version also uh, integrates better with provisioning because you, it will push also asset information into the provisioning requisition. And uh, yeah, it, we in, in O11, actually, the, the, the integration could have been improved by using reactors, which is a feature which is built into SaltStack since O11, but I didn't do it because it's still kind of experimental. Right now, the, 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 I think the, right now the, 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 the version, the sta latest stable version is O13. So you see that it's going very fast. So this is the big picture of the second version of the integration. I drew it by hand. So, uh, so this is the salt stack master here on the top. And uh, you see that it has its own event bus that you actually hook into. So basically, there are two components of the integration. There is a component which taps into the event bus and says, 
listen, I want to be notified whenever there's a new key event because, as I said before, you know, the PKI is actually critical to this uh, implementation. So what I say, uh, you know, whenever the PKI infrastructure gets a new key added or a key deleted, I want to be notified so that I can take action and add the minion or remove the minion from the OpenMS configuration. So this PKI is basically the, all the infrastructure that is used to secure the communication and authenticate the communication between the minions and the master. If you fire up a new computer and you install the salt minion on this and you want it to communicate with the master, you will have to accept the minion key on the master. That is, this is a, a critical step. If you don't accept the key on the minion, on the master, the minion will not be part of your manageable uh, um, group. So, and, the, and, and the moment that you accept the key on the master is the moment that the minion, uh, that, is that the integration will know about your new host and it will actually push it into OpenMS. So this first part here, actually simply listen for events and then push them into a queue. And the queue actually will then be consumed by a consumer process, which is down here. So this, this one here in, in the top is the listener process, which listens for PKI events and then push them into a queue. And the queue is later consumed by a consumer, which actually parses the event and takes action. So fetches the information from the configuration database and finds out which kind of which uh, provisioning group you want the minion to be added to, and then push the information into OpenMS. The consumer process, I decided uh, to run it uh, from cron, so every 20 minutes or something like that, because in the moment that the, the key is added to the master, the master has not yet pushed any configuration to the minion. So you want to allow a suitable amount of time, which actually depends on your needs, between the moment that you have the minion in your configuration and the moment that you actually import the minion into OpenMS. Usually five or six minutes or ten minutes are more than enough to, uh, to allow for the master to push the configuration changes to the minion. So 20 minutes look li looks like a, a pretty safe boundary. Also this allows, say that you are deploying like 10 new machines. You don't want you know, to import your provisioning, your provisioning requisition 10 times in a row. You want actually to uh, import it only once for 10 machines. So it's actually more efficient on the OpenMS side, I guess. Maybe Taurus can. Um, uh, here you see the OpenMS server and the communication between the consumer and the OpenMS server actually reuses the provision.pl script. So I didn't implement the REST API, the, the OpenMS REST API uh, in, in Python in the consumer, but I simply fork provision.pl with the appropriate parameters and I just let it run. Uh, let the, the RAR, some REST, OpenMS REST API in Python. I don't know. <coughs> Should be somewhere, I remember. Well, the next version could actually integrate the REST API inside because um, since the consumer is actually running in, in my I mean, in my case is running on the on the salt master, I had to copy over the provision.ps script and then install the the per dependencies. It's not a complicated thing because you go on cpan, you start up the cpan shell, you fetch the dependencies, and it, it probably takes five minutes or so to get it, to get it running properly. Uh, but uh, one could actually, you know, if there was a Python interface, you could actually use that. Uh, there is an after the best of the app, but uh, if I'm right, I don't know if there are any Python. Or I think, I think, I think, yeah, I did a quick check, and and, and I didn't find anything, but. So this is the actual code minus imports and comments of the event listener service. So you see it's actually pretty simple. <coughs> so in the first line, we start up the, um, the we, we bind to the um, event bus on the master server. And then we simply uh, wait for new, for new events to come in. And you can see here the, that I use the tag key, which means basically um, 
um, I want to be notified only of PKI events. So the tag here actually means uh, I'm interested only in PKI events. If I said, uh, if I didn't specify any tag, I would be notified of anything that's going on on the Salt Master. So jobs, configuration pushes, and stuff like that, and also PKI events. So then we, um, the integration inspects every event, and it looks up the ID of the minion, which is actually uh, specified in the payload of the event, and depending on the action that is carried in the event, so if it's an accept action, which means that the salt master has actually accepted the key uh, of the minion, we push it an add action into the queue, and if it's a delete action, we push a delete action into the queue. So the queue is a Redis queue. Um, I don't know if you know Redis, it's a key value store with cool features like being accessible over the network. So um, I decided to use that because I didn't know where actually to store the information and, and I need a persistent store where I could, where I could push information and uh, reuse them later in the consumer because I didn't want the process to run in the same, in, in the, the, the two processes to run in the same process. So in the middle between the, the event listener and the, and the consumer process, there is this Redis instance, which is installed um, all on the same, on, always on the same, on the salt master. And basically, uh, Redis, for those who don't know, is, 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 as I said, a shared queue and key value store. So basically, it's a big hash map uh, or um, array, or depends on what you need it to be. And, and it's accessible through the network. So you can actually, you know, like uh, have this, um, a data store which is uh, which you can access from different processes and it's persistent somehow. Um, basically what we use uh, Redis is for very simple operations. So we have this queue and we push information operations into the queue and then the, the queue um, and then the operations are fetched from the queue from the, from, for, from the consumer in order. So we process actually the, the, uh, the, the events in order. And then it is also used by the consumer to store uh, the OpenMS node ID and requisition in, in Redis because there's one uh, important thing to note that when we receive the delete event, the medium is no longer available for us to, to, to interrogate. We can no longer get know anything about the medium because we just removed it from the salt master. So how do we know the medium ID and the requisition that the, the minion was uh, added to, because we don't have that information in SaltStack anymore. We just removed the minion from SaltStack. So I had to store it somewhere else, and, and for the time being, I store it into Redis. So this is, an, this is an example here below. It's actually a small font. I don't know if you see it, but um, this is an, uh, I queried the, the Redis server and for, for all the keys, and you see the kind of information that is into the Redis server. So the first part here before the slash, it's the requisition name, and the second part is the minion ID, which is a um, computed random, uh, random string. So then there is this consumer process, which is actually started from Crontab, as I said. The consumer process is also a Python script. Uh, the first thing it does, it locks the queue to prevent concurrent access and you know, uh, to, event, to, to consumer processes messaging with each other. And then you start processing the queue, and it fetches the data, the information, then pushes the information through provision.pl calls into, into OpenMS. Uh, it has uh, many command line options, and the command line options are actually for uh, specifying the URL of the OpenMS server, the username and password to log in to the REST API, and it also supports dry run mode. So you can actually uh, see the commands that the consumer process is actually going to run. So you can actually check if, if it's going to work properly or not, and you can actually run the comments manually if you want, so you can see the, the output, or um, maybe for first, time, for first time runs, it's actually appropriate to do, to do a dry run mode. Um, so we see that in, in this second uh, version of the integration, we ticked a little bit more boxes. So the, the first cool thing is that it's almost, it should say almost, aligned with ops, which means that you provision a new server and within 20 minutes the new server will be 
into the monitoring system. It also supports decommissioning, which means that if I take that system now from, uh, and I remove it from SaltStack, it will also remove from OpenMS. So the two things are actually completely aligned. It is provisioning aware, uh, so we use provisioning and capacity policies and all the stuff. Um, it supports metadata, so uh, we can actually specify lots of metadata. Or basically, we can put all the asset information into uh, OpenMS and, um, and the categories uh, into, uh, into SaltStack, I'm sorry, and then have that information pulled out of SaltStack and copied into OpenMS. And I'll show you an example. Uh, supports the commissioning. And it's, uh, you have to do some coding, but it's actually a very, I had to do some coding, but it's actually uh, very little coding because it's on around 200 lines of code that includes comments and sanity checks, you know, command line arguments checks. So it's actually pretty tight, pretty small integration. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is an example of some metadata that I have defined into SaltStack the, uh, on one of the first runs. So basically, in SaltStack, you have uh, this, uh, these data structures, which are called pillar, where you specify metadata about the, mm, the nodes, or about actually your system. And you can see here that I have specified for a certain server the requisition name, which is main site, uh, do you see it, or you see it better like this? Uh, the categories, so I want to go into the surveillance categories, production and servers, and the asset information. The asset information is actually a hash map, so you can actually use all asset information keys that you actually have in, in OpenMS. So you're not limited to just comment, you can actually use anything that you have in OpenMS. And the thing that I did, since I had uh, this information to SaltStack, I also put it into uh, using SaltStack um, configuration management feature. I pushed it onto also into the node so that when I log into the node, the, the same information is so shown to me in the message of the day. So I can actually know what, what, what that node is actually doing when I log in. So this is an example. When I log into the host, you see that uh, the system information and the tags are actually uh, shown to you the first time you log in or every time you log in, actually. So this is handy if you have like a, a sysadmin group, anyone logs into the system, he immediately sees what the, what the system does. Uh, one, one thing that one could do is also put the link to the OpenMS page here, so you can actually just copy and paste it into your browser, and actually see immediately uh, from the monitoring perspective what's going on. Um, so this is the requisition, how it looks like in OpenMS. This wasn't edited, it was, it's exactly what the provisioning, what the consumer process does. So you see that he actually created the requisition main site. I'm sorry, you should use mouse. So he actually created the requisition main site uh, because he will actually create the requisition if it's not there already. It added a node. You can see here that the, the, the idea of the node is the same that we saw before into the Redis database. Then it set the categories appropriately. So you can see that production and server has been set appropriately. And it also copied over this, the asset information, so the comment on the server. And this is how the node page looks. So you have here the, um, the same information. You can see the surveillance categories are here. And then the comment information is here. And, and the requisition name is here. So this is, oh, so this is, actually, this is actually all that I have. Um, I just wanted to, to leave you with a couple of thoughts. And it was actually um, Alex who threw this idea uh, that, you know, to see if there are other uh, talks that are actually connected to yours. And so I start with the last point. So uh, this afternoon there is this let yourself go with the flow session which I think somehow connects with this one because it's also about software-defined X, where X in this case is network. In my case, it could be infrastructure. Um, because I think this where this integration could be um, uh, very useful is where you have like a public cloud infrastructure. So you're actually deploying machine from within SaltStack and automatically, and you don't know, you, don't, you couldn't possibly know how many machines are actually being taken up and down. Maybe you have a, a, a 
uh, scaling solution that actually scales machines up or down, like in the case of uh, the Amazon load balancer. And in that case, you, you don't know machines that are being taken up or down because you, you, you can't possibly know. It's, it's, it's all automatic. In that case, it's, it's useful to have, um, it could be useful to have uh, an integration like this because machines will be added and removed from the monitoring system as soon as they get into the, they, they, they are alive and they are taken down. Uh, one, one aspect that I actually uh, um, find uh, strategic is in that integrability matters. And I think that with this respect, OpenMS and SaltStack, they're both awesome tools because they have APIs for integration with, 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 with each other and with other systems, like the event bus API, which is present in SaltStack. I think it's totally awesome because you can actually hook into the system and react to events and push events. And I wish there was something like that in OpenMS too. Like, you know, you could tap into the event bus in OpenMS and actually uh, process events in a separate system. Um, automation is becoming more and more a requirement. So I think we're going to see more kind of integrations like this because in, you know, uh, automation like configuration management automation is pushing the, 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 the boundaries of what we can do with software. And so in software-defined infrastructure, network, or whatever else, uh, there will be more and more automation. And in this case, automations like this, like this integration, I think they will be um, actually a requirement for, for systems. And I think that's it. So if you, if you have any questions, I take them now. Great. Yep. Uh, Stefano? Is the person who wrote the, the integration uh, within another system they have with OpenMS in the same way you do? So the problem is always the same. Keep the things in synchronization. And uh, do you use it, uh, per, uh, Python libraries to do that? You write it in Python, right? Python library. Python library. And uh, the, pi the libraries are this one, Py OpenMS users. Oh, this one. I didn't know. Uh, should be uh, this one. Pi on a mass util. All right. Well, I didn't yeah, know about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's not good. You know, sometimes you have the libraries, but they don't work. So, <laughs> no, that's... Uh, that's that's good to know. Yeah. <coughs> it's, uh, uh, this is a classical problem uh, you have. Uh, so, the, the problem of integration. Uh, I think uh, that the, the way in which uh, over mass... Uh, creates the REST interface is really helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely strategic, yeah. Absolutely strategic. That's what I want to ask you. So you find it uh, very useful at the end. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the fact that you actually uh, programmatically command the monitoring system, I think it's, you know, you, you have to add that feature. You cannot have that feature and say that you have an enterprise monitoring system, you know? It's about integration. If you, if you want to integrate, you have to have a, a, a way that you actually you know send commands programmatically. You don't want to do it all manually, right? Absolutely. Okay. At least one agrees. <laughs> I agree. I know. I know. There's also um, because Ronnie mentioned yesterday. There is also a um, provisional adapter for Puppet. And I don't, I don't know how that works. Maybe someone of you checked it out or knows something know about how it. it works. And uh, I think uh, David just wrote the provisional adapter for Puppet. And you, do you know how it works? The for which provisional adapter? Puppet. Um, I don't know. I believe he's written a, sorry, I don't believe he's written I haven't seen an adapter for Puppet. He wrote the DNS provision adapter. No, he wrote also the Puppet provision adapter first. Yeah, Ronnie mentioned it yesterday. Quite sure. It wasn't the Google. <laughs> <laughs> Let me Google for you. No, it's better than you from, I don't know, more than 20 years, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but if, if it works as a provisioning adapter, I think it has a cron schedule like that. It's, uh, but uh, it's, uh, the difference is that uh, uh, typically the provisioning adapter in which, you know, in this kind of uh, um, 
of, uh, of uh, integration, you have one master uh, server. The master server is that uh, which holds all the information and then pushes the information on the other uh, devices. Uh, the idea behind the provisioning adapter is that the master server is over MS. So you provision the nodes inside of MS and it actually provision uh, all the data in Puppet, something like that. No, I think it's the other way around. I think it fetches data from Puppet. If this is the provisioning adapter, if it is the provisioning adapter, but uh, of course it's difficult to, to speak about something you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's no, no, it's no, not actually, difficult. It's, it's, it's possible. Difficult. You can go it's on possible, for hours. It's not, uh, <laughs> Correct. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, okay. It's easy to make. Uh, So, the problem is always who is the master, okay? In, the wish, in this node import, is just like the DNS. Yeah. It's uh, 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 OpenMS act as a slave server. So it says, oh, I know that the information is somewhere there, and let me uh, keep in sync with this uh, solution. In the, the adapters are, uh, they are different. And because uh, uh, they use, um, they were uh, called when uh, some operation on the requisition is, is made. And the three operations you can do on the requisition are add, delete, and update. Okay? So, and the adapter uh, has an interface that uh, has meters for one of the three ports. All right. So, uh, so it's a requisition it's, importer. It's, uh, it's just so this means that, for example, we have a DNS adapter that is not the DNS importer. All right. And also we have a, a reverse DNS adapter. And this means that I, prov I, you provision? Do, yeah. I provision the nodes in OpenMS, and then OpenMS is able to use an S update to update, to update this, a DNS server. The DNS server All right. and so on. So, and that's because there, there exists a puppet provisioning adapter. I have to guess, I cannot be sure, that if so you, this okay. adapter works in the same way it works, the provisioning adapter. Okay, so you say it's an adapter. I don't know. Yes, let me, I try to, okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And there was something that I had to say, but. So any more questions? So we wait for him to Google and <laughs> so well, before I leave you, I just wanted to show well, for those who may be interested uh, our configuration file for SaltStack. So this is how you define uh, that you want Apache to be installed on, on a Minium. And it's YAML, so it's actually a text file with the indentation and the like special uh, syntax like a dash and columns. So it's really simple to learn and to get started with. And here, basically, uh, you, if you read it, uh, if you read it through, actually, it sounds like English. So it says, I want the package package installed, and I want the Apache service running, but you should know and this is information you, you give to SaltStack, that the Apache service requires the package called Apache. So, it's, I mean, even, even if you just read it through, it sounds very natural, sounds like English language. So, this is one of the reasons that I chose SaltStack over Puppet or Chef. 
and also because I wanted to have the remote execution feature, like you can actually push comments immediately to the minions. So you want to reload Apache in all your web front facing servers, you just type the command and it will actually do the reload immediately without having to wait or resorting to another separate tool. So I guess that's it. Uh, I have another question. Uh, sorry, maybe you told, but I, I lost. Uh, how you map the requisition from source back? So we have requisition in the oh, Yeah, there is actually, uh, the, the all also using a YAML file, you can actually map the node to the profiles. So you basically say, I want this node to be to have this profile. So you know, so you so assign. The positions uh, matches the profiles. Exactly, exactly. So there, there's this uh, idea of profiles. Let's see if I if I, if I find one here. Um, Unfortunately, there isn't <laughs> an example here. But it works, it works, it really works like this, you know. You basically have, you basically have a file like this, which is called the top file, and the top file is like the, the, the root from which you start including all the state files. And it, it, say, in this line, you would say, I want uh, node x, to have the uh, web server profile. And then it will, and then SaltStack will find out about the node X minion and will look up the, the web server profile and fetch all the information and push it to the minion. So actually you have a very simple structure like this and you can use actually uh, glob selectors. So you can use say all the web servers that are called web star. Uh, so you can actually select all, all, all minions based on if you have a naming uh, policy in, in place, or you can select minions by IP address range, or you can actually add uh, by tags or something like that. Uh, so it's pretty flexible. So I think it's over. If there are no more questions, I mean. Okay, thank you. <laughs>